Welcome to Talking Business, a podcast produced in Melbourne, Australia. The podcast is available on the Acast app, the Apple Podcast Store, or wherever you go to get your podcasts. Or you can get it at the Business Acumen website at www.businessacumen.biz. I am Leon Gettler. My job is to review and monitor the week's news in business, finance and economics. I bring it all to you every week. This is episode number 45 in our series for 2021, and today's date is Friday, December the 10th. First, I'll be talking to Grant Emanuel, Global Marketing Director for the Chamberlain Group, Australia's leading manufacturer in garage door openers and accessories, embracing change and adopting a nimble approach to the ever-evolving economic landscape. Emanuel has navigated a new world of online-led strategy, virtual office banter, and a more adaptive approach to accommodating the needs of individual markets with different economic, social and health circumstances. And I'll be talking to IFM Chief Economist Alex Joyner about the outlook for 2022. But now, let's talk to Grant Emanuel. Grant, Chamberlain is a a global company and it's changed immediately now. There's no travel, there's remote working. How are you guys handling it? Yeah, well, it's very different. We've really worked probably the last three to four months basically remotely, everyone that can. Uh, And even recently, we just had our a meeting that we normally would travel to the US for, which we actually ended up doing virtually over three sort of days. So we've really shifted to a Teams-based model where we use Microsoft Teams basically for all meetings that need a face-to-face uh, contact. And we've been doing a lot more of those sort of meetings as opposed to, you know, actual face-to-face. So, I mean, you've got offices globally. You've got offices in the US, UK, Germany. Yep. So how do you handle that? We Well, it's one that say to handle it or one thing that we do it. So... Basically, myself, what I try and do is, with the different time zones, it's obviously tough to have, you know, a very loose schedule. We have to really plan out what we want to do and be quite flexible. So typically what I would do is we would have US updates of a morning uh, because that's their time zone and then allocate time for the European businesses in the afternoons on certain days. So, for example, a Tuesday might be a US day and then a Wednesday might be a Europe day and then so on and so forth. So... We are fairly flexible, though, in how we how we do it. But we try and do end of their day in the US, which is the start of our day, and then the start of the European day, which is the end of our day. So it comes down to a lot of planning and also just a bit of flexibility. And, of course, there's no international travel, so you really have to be no. stay super flexible on this. Absolutely. You know, and I think that the different groups, you know, it's a different way that we interact. Some of them are short, sharp catch-ups. Some of them are more in-depth strategic discussions that, you know, take longer than 10 minutes and different groups and different areas prefer different contact frequencies. Some want weekly catch up, some want monthly, some want bi-monthly. Uh, so yeah, we do have to be quite flexible, but I think we've done a good job in managing that. And we have been managing those various locations for a number of years. So we're sort of used to that side of it. I suppose the non-travel side as what changed things for us. The Australian business, I mean, you guys sell garage door openers and accessories. I mean, do you, do you actually sell that internationally? Do you export that to, say, Asia or other markets? We, we don't export much here from Australia now. We do sell in different countries through the different divisions. So right, okay. for the Australian division, we would sell through to Australia, obviously New Zealand, as well as the Middle East. And then out of the European business, we basically sell to everywhere in Europe and in North America essentially everywhere in North America and Canada. So that's sort of our footprint. Some of our customers would on sell to other markets, but generally speaking, we would, you know, those markets that we serve is, is what I mentioned. Now, now, what's interesting here is, I mean, how do you handle sales with customers remotely? That, that, that would be an entire new way of working for your sales team, wouldn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, some of our sales team have been able to sell in somewhat sort of face-to-face manners, obviously following social distancing protocols, etc. But I think what it is, Leon, it's credit to our sales team's relationships, a lot of our customers, that we can do these things remotely and they can do them over, over Skype or over Teams or whatever it may be, and a lot of stuff over the phone as well. Uh, we've even done different innovative ways of meeting customers in car parks, for example, staying in our cars from a distance and talking through the windows. Um, So certain customers that wanted that contact are still able to get that contact. But yeah, I think it's testament to the relationships that we have, that they understand what we need to do and can do those things without just face-to-face contact. Now, what has that meant for your workplace culture? I mean, have have you had to change that? Yeah, so our culture, 
The mantra we live by is one team. Uh, and I think we do a lot of stuff together. Uh, and I think recently what it's done is that we've done different virtual things now to try and keep that team morale and team communications together. So before COVID, we used to do a weekly communications meeting on a Monday morning, which was not a you know very heavy, detailed meeting. It was rather a bit more of a fun meeting where we would sort of say, this is what's happening this week. This is how sales are going. This is what's coming up next week. It was just to keep everyone informed of, I suppose, the key activities within the business. So we've continued that, obviously, during COVID. And instead of me presenting it face-to-face to the group, I do it over Teams, which, is, which has been fine. And then we also have done, uh, within the different departments, different virtual catch-ups with our team. So, for example, in my group, we do what we call a virtual coffee catch-up, where we all get a coffee and we, we chat around not even just work stuff, but just general stuff of how we're traveling and what we're up to. So we're trying to take that water cooler conversation from the office and making it virtual. So we've been doing that every week, twice a week, and seems to work really well, keeps everyone engaged uh, because people have different levels of activity going on. So some people were homeschooling, some people had no, no one else at home, so they were craving that attention. Uh, so that we found that was a really beneficial one. Uh, and then we've continued those weekly communications to be twice a week and sometimes three times a week, just to make sure everyone's updated and you know, knows what's going on. One of the issues with remote working, of course, is that there's a whole issue of uh, some people really need constant feedback. Mm. And how do you provide that in a remote working environment? Yeah, it's a good question. So again, to give you a real example, um, you know, a couple of people on my team, some like that feedback immediately and some like it less and in more of a structured way. So we've just managed that. So some people I catch up with nearly daily, some I catch up with once a week and some I catch up maybe once or twice a week. So again, it's just about being flexible to what people's needs are. And we try and not sort of, you know, shoehorn everyone into the same feedback loop or whatever they need. So we are flexible in managing what people's expectations are. And I would, I would imagine some would, uh, working from home would really suit some of your staff members and uh, for others would be wanting to come back. Would that be right? Spot on. <laughs> it's not a blanket approach. You know, it's funny. Some people are saying, when can I go back to the office? And some are saying, geez, this work from home works for me quite well. Um, you think about people that commute a lot as well. You know, people are saying to me, I'm saving two hours or two and a half hours a day not commuting. And not to say they would work those two hours, but they might do an extra half an hour's work or whatever they need to do for them to make their time more manageable. Um, but it also might mean they might be able to go on a walk at lunchtime. So it's changed, the, I think, the mental health space as well for them to you know, be more flexible. But there are definitely people who need to be face-to-face or want to be face-to-face as part of their job. It's just the, the nature of the business sometimes. So, yeah, we've got a varying rate of people. There's no blanket solution where everyone says, I want to work from home or I want to be back in the office. Very, di- very diverse. I would imagine, though, that once people start going back to work, there will be some will say, look, uh, i come back to work but how about me working say four days a week and one day working from home or three days a week and two days working from home uh can you see that happening yeah we can we've started to plan out a little bit our policy on what we're going to do um because the one thing we don't want to do is say people say well i'm going to work from home now without a conversation you know some people's jobs might not allow that on a full-time basis it might not suit the requirements of the role so we're actually developing a new policy where we would work with individual employees to work out how we best manage uh, the different changes. Because as we know, and as we've seen in Victoria recently, you know, the cases spike again, what do you do? Do you have to go back into full lockdown, everyone working from home? You know, what's our transition plan and and what's our our contingency when these sort of spikes happen? Uh, So again, we've got to be flexible with it uh, and also work with the employees to say, look, based on your role, we think that you need to be in the office X amount of time. Uh, we, we think we can accommodate this. But again, it's going to be on a, a case-by-case basis because everyone's roles and responsibilities are very different. And that will mean talking to each and every employee about that, wouldn't it? Absolutely. And we're empowering our leaders within the organisation to do that with their teams. And that's in all the offices, uh, both here and and overseas as well. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, correct. And so, well, we'll watch that with great interest and grant it's been fantastic talk to you and i'm sure everyone will be watching it very closely thank you very much for your time all right thanks Leon. cheers and now let's talk to ifm chief economist alex joiner 
Well, Alex, the economy is contracted by 1.9%, which was not unexpected. And uh, so how do you think it's going to be travelling into 2022? It was quite an interesting result, Leon. It was actually better than expected, even though this is the third largest contraction in the economy or in real GDP uh, since 1959, since the data began. It was actually better than markets had expected. And what economists sort of got wrong going in was, I guess, the impact that the restrictions might have on the services side of household spending, which wasn't as bad as expected. Nonetheless, uh, the two major economies, as well as the ACT, um, uh, Victoria and New South Wales, went backwards materially. And that was particularly true of New South Wales that saw a minus 6.5% result for state final demand. Uh, Victoria was a negative, but not, not as bad, minus 1.4%. All the other states, when you combine them, they actually went up 1.4%. So they sort of went from strength to strength. So you can really see that lockdown impact. And hoping that the Omicron variant does not see any restrictions placed on economic activity for the last part of the fourth quarter, then we should see a material rebound in economic growth coming out of Victoria and New South Wales as the restrictions lift it. And economists are, are pretty confident about that. We already know that households going into this had a lot of cash on their balance sheets or, or cash that they couldn't spend. And one of the notable things in the national accounts was just how high the savings ratio increased um, or how dramatically it increased and how high it got it increased from 11.8 percent to 19.8 percent that's a, a really big increase it shows that in the first instances households had little to do especially in new south wales and victoria in the third quarter than to sit around and save uh, and what it gives us confidence for is a, a real material uh, rebound in household consumption in the fourth quarter. And hopefully that gets some sustainability that carries us through to uh, the end of 2022 as well. So, uh, so where do you see economic growth coming to? I mean, it was tracking before pre-pandemic at about 2 2.5%. Two do you see going beyond that? Well, that's the thing. And it, it's, it's the big question. It's, there's no doubt that Australia and other advanced economies around the world will have above trend growth uh, in 2022, but that is very much artificial. It is, it is based on you know, record, low, record low interest rates and stimulatory monetary policy, but also that fiscal side, which has been a real tailwind and is still there and evident in, like I said, household balance sheet with, with cash pent up there. So 2022 is sort of a a very good growth year, but it's a very artificial one. And as you say, you know, the, the growth narrative leading up to the pandemic was, was, pretty, was pretty modest, it was, you know, it was a, a, an economy, especially in Australia, that was burdened by low productivity, which is a sort of a, something that is reverberating around most advanced economies in the world. And specifically in the Australian case, it was a, an economy that was over-reliant on, on population growth. Now, what seems to be the case is that we will recover to that paradigm beyond 2022. We can already see in, in the numbers and, and in the official forecast as well, so from the Treasury and the Reserve Bank, that growth very, very much decelerates in a year-on-year -year sense in 2023. So... It goes back to sort of a, what you might call as an economist, a potential rate of growth that is around two and a half percent, maybe a little bit lower in Australia's, in Australia's case. Now, the things that might change that are, you know, increased participation in the workforce, and that would need to be underpinned by strong population growth. But also, uh, and this is what economists sort of cry out for all the time, is, is better productivity growth. And that's really going to be the thing that we need to see if we are going to see growth rates materially different in the future to what they were in the lead up to the pandemic. And look, do you have much confidence in that? Well, I'm, I'm probably pretty skeptical. What we expect as economists, I guess, going forward or in the near term will be colored by the federal election, which is probably going to happen in May. And, you know, the narrative that will come out of that 
federal election is which side can do better on debt and deficit and which side can keep your interest rates lower or have kept interest rates lower. Now, these are, are pretty meaningless in terms of the economic debate that economists have, but they're important politically uh, and they seem to get a bit of traction politically. What will be missing from the debate more than likely is what any potential government is going to do on that reform agenda, on the, on the reforming of tax, uh, beyond tax cuts, uh, you know, can we reform the system to make it more efficient uh, and get efficiencies out of the economy? Because this is really what economies such as Australia, but all over the world need, is the fiscal side of things or the government side of things to pick up the, you know, pick up the baton, I guess, on growth that central banks have carried for far too long. So we're going to need some real reforms in tax issues, and uh, we're also going to have to see policies geared towards productivity growth as well. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's, it's I guess what, what governments need to try and foster is an environment in which businesses see a better outlook, uh, and therefore they want to invest on the basis of that outlook and invest in not only the productivity of their their workforce but you know invest in things like technology and ways to sort of get more out of uh, out of the existing inputs that they have i suppose the other side of it is also some of the longer term things that we that we talk about to drive productivity and this is things around training uh, education these sorts of things where now australia has, has in some sense, uh, fallen a little bit behind uh, in that regard. And these are all things that the Productivity Commission look at and suggest as, as possible remedies for productivity over the longer term. And that, that's really the crux of the issue is productivity is a long-term concept. And you know, often uh, government policy and certainly monetary policy is something that looks at economic cycles rather than structural economic issues that will, that will prevail or have prevailed for an extended period of time. Now, the issue with productivity changes and productivity policies is they are all politically loaded, aren't they? I mean, you, you might need, say, changes in ed education and training systems, for example. That's right. It's always the difficulty with productivity is that there are going to be winners and losers out of any reforms that come to uh, boost overall productivity or net productivity for the economy. And that's what makes it politically diff difficult to get some of these things through. It's also the case that there is this split between the federal side of government and the state side of government, because a lot of the policies that, for example, the Productivity Commission would put forward as uh, appropriate to boost productivity growth come from the states. Uh, so the federal government has little power to do anything about that. that Education is probably a good example of that. What we need to see is sort of a more coherent approach taken to this, maybe driven at the federal level to try and, I guess, compel or encourage the states to undertake some of these reforms that, as you say, can be uh, politically challenging because you are making changes to things without necessarily being able to show a near-term benefit that you can sort of leverage off, I guess, in a political sense. Productivity reforms will have a benefit likely years in, down the track and can be measured better years down the track. What is difficult is to measure, measure them in the near term. So there is a sort of a, an article of faith here that, you know, if, if governments did this, that they will be good for the economy. But we can only show that uh, with the fullness of time. Right, okay, okay. And, uh, and so all of that will be, uh, we'll know more after the federal election in May. Uh, hopefully we will. And, you know, I don't think there is a clear favourite going into the election, but I guess the expectations of the electorate might be, uh, uh, you know, higher than they otherwise might be because, you know, what I think we need to see is a narrative that comes out is, you know, how can we make the economy better after this pandemic? You know, we will no doubt recover from it. Uh, that's true. You know, the level of GDP and level of output and activity and those sorts of things will go back to what they, what they were and they'll push on from that. But how can we actually make the economy better and more inclusive uh, for everyone that participates in it? Well, Alex, that's uh, all fascinating. And uh, thank you very much for your help during the year and uh, wishing you all the best for Christmas. You too. Thanks a lot, Leon. So what's happening in the news? Well, the Reserve Bank and Treasury are considering the feasibility of a central digital currency 
under reforms aimed at establishing a regulated onshore cryptocurrency industry and driving competition across buy now, pay later and digital wallet payment systems. The burgeoning US $2 trillion of crypto assets sector, which more than 2 million Australians have exposure to, will face a new licensing regime to protect retail investors and lift requirements on crypto exchange operators. A key element of the government's reform package will focus on the merits of a retail central bank digital currency, following similar considerations by regional partners including Singapore and Malaysia. The CBDC would offer a type of digital currency issued by a central bank and linked to sovereign currency, allowing for conversion between different forms of money. A retail CBDC would provide a digital version of cash that was universally accessible. With the RBA and central banks across the globe actively investigating technologies to support CBDCs, a senior government source said the proposal was akin to an RBA-backed Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. This follows last week's collapse of the second cryptocurrency platform in the space of months, with Australia-based MyCryptoWallet users no longer able to access their funds. Investor losses at the other failed cryptocurrency outfit, Blockchain Global, have more than doubled to more than $50 million. New Australian consumer watchdog figures reveal a 172% increase in cryptocurrency scam losses between January and November this year, totalling $109 million. Everything from the way Australians buy goods and services to their investment in cryptocurrencies will be overhauled over the next 12 months in the biggest change to the nation's payment system since the heyday of the checkbook. Australia's payment system has undergone sweeping changes in recent years amid a boom in tap-and-go transactions on smartphones and buy-now-pay-later services such as Afterpay. Consumers are turning their backs on traditional payment systems with a number of personal cheques written, falling by 95% over the past two decades, while ATM cash withdrawals are down two-thirds since 2011. At the same time, cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin have taken off, albeit as a new form of speculative investment rather than a practical way of making payments. Commonwealth Bank last month became the first local bank to allow its customers to trade cryptocurrency through its app, which is used by millions of Australians. While other art sectors have been struggling, the value of film and television production surged to a record $1.9 billion last financial year, as Australia became one of the world's safest places to shoot during the pandemic. Screen Australia's annual report on drama production shows that foreign projects were worth $1.04 $1.04 billion alone. This included the television dramas that started filming here during the year, often with Australians in lead roles. Nine Perfect Strangers for Hulu, Netflix's Escape from Spiderhead, God's Favourite Idiot and Pieces of Her, Universal Matchbox's La Brie and Young Rock, and Amazon's The Wilds. Three foreign movies boosted the total. Marvel's Thor, Love and Thunder, the Liam Neeson action thriller Blacklight, and Ron Howard's Thai cave rescue drama 13 Lives. After production stalled during the first pandemic lockdown, spending on Australian films and so-called official co-productions with other countries more than doubled to $500 million. Leading the way was Baz Luhrmann's Elvis Presley's biopic, George Miller's fantasy 3,000 Years of Longing, Thriller Gold, comedy Wog Boys Forever, musical Dramedy, Seriously Red, Tim Winton adaptation Blueback, and Port Arthur shooting drama Nitran. While cinemas struggled with shutdowns, production boomed with foreign projects seeking a safe, filming location, the creation of COVID safe shooting guidelines and such industry support measures as the Federal Government's Location Incentive Program and Temporary Interruption Fund. And the Australian Council of Superannuation Investors has released its inaugural policy on First Nations engagement, which has been developed with advice of the National Native Title Council. The policy has been developed following a research program conducted with the Church of England Pensions Board. Last year, AXI, the CEPB, and 64 institutional investors co-signed a letter sent to 78 global mining companies seeking information on their First Nations engagement. About 46% of mining companies' reserves lie on land inhabited by First Nations people, but only 38% of ASX 200 companies disclosed information related to their Indigenous engagement practices or the management of the risks around this. Further, The research found a number of companies have adopted standards that only require them to seek consent rather than actually obtaining it. Indeed, the International Council on Mining and Metals position statement on Indigenous peoples say companies should work to obtain the consent of Indigenous communities rather than stating consent actually needs to be obtained. AXI's policy position is guided by the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and contains six key principles. Access risk, 
align with international standards, develop strong relationships and robust agreements, conduct effective risk management, monitor performance and disclose. At the heart of the policy is a philosophy of obtaining free, prior and informed consent from First Nations people. The idea might sound obvious, but it actually exposes the way some mining companies have dodged their responsibilities on occasions. And the Reserve Bank has left the interest rate at 0.1%, but left the door open for a rate rise in 2022 by dropping any reference to 2023 in its key final par. It is waiting for wages to rise by 3 to 3.5%. It reiterated that it won't hike until inflation is well within the central bank's 2 to 3% target. And all search proxy votes have overwhelmingly backed the $21 billion merger with Santos, creating a top 20 listed ASX company and one of the 20 biggest oil and gas companies in the world. Some 95.43% of proxy votes cast were in favour of the merger, all search said in an ASX statement on Tuesday, with just 4.3% opposed. The deal needed the support of 75% of shareholders who cast their vote to get over the line. Santos will own 61.5% of the merged company, to oil searches 38.5%. And construction group Lang O'Rourke is designing a prototype railway station to examine how it can minimise carbon emissions and build infrastructure more efficiently, including using modular components that can be built in factories. Mark Dimmock, Lang O'Rourke's Director for Clients and Market, said the construction group, which is upgrading railway stations in New South Wales to make them easier for people with disabilities to use, have been urged by the state government to use more innovative materials and methods of construction to avoid doing future projects in a cookie-cutter fashion. Lang O'Rourke is also experimenting with using batteries and solar power for lighting in stations, as well as wireless communications so that telecommunications cables don't have to be laid down, which saves money on materials. It hopes to have the prototype finished by mid-2022 to show the government what kind of stations it could potentially build when it tenders for more rail projects later next year. Georgina North, operations leader for Langrock's Technology and Innovation Group, said the company was using robotics, digital products, data analytics, Internet of Things, 3D printing and advanced manufacturing of materials in projects. Autonomous trucks and excavators that are common in the mining industry are now also starting to be used in construction, she said. But she said there was not enough investment in new technology in Australia and that it took time for companies developing new robotic technologies to bring them to Australia. And Woolworths is banking on health and beauty products as a growth path with a surprise $872 million bid for Australian Pharmaceutical Industries, which owns its Priceline pharmacy, pharmacy chain and runs 86 clear skincare outlets. It's a pass and offer from West Farmers, the owner of Kmart, Target and Bunnings. The duo are now wrestling for control of API. And West Farmers' own department store, Target, is looking to lean on the online and in-store smarts of online shopping giants Amazon as part of a cloud services-led push to increase online sales and revive performance in its lockdown-hit shops. The high-profile retailer has selected Amazon Web Services as its cloud supplier of choice over rivals such as Microsoft Azure, adopting technology it says it makes its websites faster, more reliable, more responsive to individual customers and 90% cheaper to run. Target's general manager of technology, Samantha McIntyre, said the company was hoping to significantly increase the performance of its online stores, which currently provides just 15.1% of overall sales. She said before adopting AWS, its systems could not handle the surge in demand during sales and new product launches, and they could now provide more up-to-date inventory for online shoppers and introduce new online shopping features in a day rather than two months it would previously take. AWS is also in use across other West Farmers brands in Officeworks and Kmart, and its global head of retail, Tom Litchford, said the pandemic had seen a big increase in investment across the sector in digital transformations, which were targeted at creating back office efficiency to fund online innovation. And many Australian boards are struggling to prepare their companies or organisations for climate change, with almost half the company's directors saying they don't know how to tackle the issue. A first-of-its-kind study by the Australian Institute of Company Directors into how boards are approaching climate change reveals that 77% of directors are concerned about how it will affect their organisations, but often fail to act. The AICD report is based on surveys of 2,000 directors at ASX-listed companies, smaller businesses, government organisations and not-for-profits. Almost half of the directors surveyed said their board should pay more attention to climate but did not know how to do so, while 28% did not think their board had the knowledge or experience to adequately address climate governance issues. Across all directors, only 11% disagreed that their board needed to do more to respond to climate change, but that rose to 22% in the mining sector. 
one in four directors in the mining sector were not at all concerned about climate risks to their company, which compared to one in five across all industries, and only 8% in the agriculture, forestry and fishing sector. Directors said the biggest obstacle to acting was the absence of a settled national climate change policy, 46% the most common response, while 38% said their board did not have the time or resources to deal with it. Less than half of directors, 46%, said their board had embedded climate change in their risk management framework, which, the report says, suggests that risk may not be adequately monitored at board level. And a huge wind farm proposed by Linter Energy off the coast of Victoria could make the Portland aluminium smelter among the country's first smelters to be powered fully by green energy. The Spinifex offshore wind project could cost up to $4 billion and create new construction and operational jobs as well as help secure jobs at the smelter site, Alinta said. News of the 1,000 megawatt project, one of several nascent offshore wind, for, wind ventures around the country, came as its biggest steelmaker, Bluescope, signed an accord with Shell that could see the Port Kembla Steelworks in New South Wales supplied with green hydrogen. The pair will investigate the design and construction of a pilot-scale 10 megawatt renewable hydrogen electrolyzer to test the use of green hydrogen in the blast furnace at the steelworks. The two proposals illustrate how some of the country's most carbon-intensive heavy industrial operations are exploring options to cut emissions. And Australians are paying more personal income tax as a share of government revenue rather than any other advanced economy except for high-taxing Scandinavian welfare state of Denmark, according to an international report that renews pressure on the coalition Labor to reform the tax system. Governments in Australia also raised almost double the amount of revenue from taxes on property compared to other wealthy nations, chiefly due to state-based stamp duty on real estate purchases, the Organisation for Economic Co Cooperation and Development report said. Personal income tax revenue rose to 42% of total tax collected by federal and state governments in 2019, nearly twice as much as the OECD average of 23.5%. The dependence on personal income tax has grown gradually by almost 5 percentage points since 2000, when the GST was introduced by the Howard government in return for personal income tax cuts. And the International Monetary Fund has piled pressure on the Treasurer Josh Frydenberg to pursue serious tax reform, arguing the economy would grow faster and more equitable after the pandemic if the corporate tax rate was cut and tax breaks of debt fueled housing were curtailed. The 10% goods and services tax should be increased and or broadened to cover some items currently exempted, while compensating low-income households with payment, the IMF said in its review of Australia's economy. The IMF urged state governments to switch away from stamp duties on property purchases and towards annual land tax based on value to encourage the people to move for jobs and to give states a more predictable revenue stream. To improve housing affordability, the IMF said tax reforms to discourage leverage housing investment by households could help dampen investor demand in residential real estate. An implicit endorsement of Labor's 2019 election policies to curtail the capital gains discount and negative gearing, which Labor has since dumped. Local governments could be offered financial incentives by federal and state governments to streamline planning and zoning approvals to boost the supply of new homes, the IMF said. The IMF became the second independent international organisation in the past two days to highlight Australia's over-dependence on taxing corporate and personal income and under-taxation of more efficient tax bases such as consumption and land. And the Finance Sector Union is taking the National Australian Bank to the Federal Court, alleging it is a culture of forcing staff to work excessive hours with complaints to managers falling on deaf ears or prompting retribution. FSU National Secretary Julia Agrizano said the regular additional unpaid hours amount to another version of wage theft and had left workers suffering unbearable levels of stress and anxiety, as well as problems sleeping, and in some cases said they had been left mentally and physically broken and alleging staff had been bullied into working up to 70 hours a week without being paid. The union claimed staff were expected to work overtime and feared being fired or performance managed if they spoke or refused. NAB refuted the claims, but acknowledged the additional pressures placed on staff during the COVID-19 pandemic, saying employees could raise concerns either directly to their line managers or via the whistleblowing hotline. And the Australian Taxation Office and Austrac could be handed sweeping new surveillance powers, including the right to bug people's phones and online communications, as part of an overhaul of telecommunications intercept laws. The federal government could also seek to harmonise the state's patchwork of laws regarding listening devices, which has complicated regulators' attempts to prosecute corporate crime. Home Affairs Minister Karen Andrews on Monday released a discussion paper about potential updates to surveillance laws which have failed to keep pace with advances in telecommunications and rely on outdated technology assumptions. 
part of the existing framework date back to the 1960s to cover the privacy of fixed-line phone calls and telegrams, with the government previously owning those networks. And that's it for this week. And next week, I'll be talking to Ben Nolan, the, found, the co-founder and CEO of one of Australia's largest last-mile delivery firm, Shaperency, the platform built and funded in a 10-week period during the COVID-19 lockdown. Shaperency is an online ecosystem that automates and digitises the process of board meetings and shareholder management. Digital minute-taking, reporting, signatures and storage replace inefficient and costly paper-based administration for board members, while shareholder portal set, sets it apart from others offering visibility and engaging shareholders, hence the name Shaperency, shareholder transparency. And I'll be talking to AMP Capital Chief Economist Shane Oliver about what we can expect from the market and economy in the 2022 post-lockdown period. In the meantime, you can catch me on Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn. And if you want, leave a comment. Wishing you all a safe and healthy 